All right, let's go ahead and start up on fizz. So for the kidney, um, we're going to start off talking a little bit about the anatomy because that helps you because it's really easy to get lost in the kidney, especially when all the words are in Greek and Latin, which is all the time. Yeah, okay, then we'll go through the anatomy at a reasonable pace. Um, but feel free to ask any questions and I'll answer them the best I can. After that, we're gonna go over um, filtration, um, the anatomy of filtration as well as the forces of filtration. And then after that, what are some of the things that the body regulates? Um, calcium levels are regulated and you sometimes want to rescue a lot of calcium, sometimes you wanna filter it out. Um, we'll also probably talk about the way the kidneys can regulate blood pressure levels using renin, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which uh, is, is controlled by the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So let's go with anatomy first. All right. So let's go ahead and start with... A kidney bean. Yay. All right. So this opening right here is called the hilum of the kidney. Hilum just means kind of opening, or at least that's what it indicates. I haven't ever looked up exactly what hilum means, but it's always the opening portion of an organ. You have a hilum for the kidney um, where you have also the renal pelvis, which is going to catch everything that is made and send it down the ureters. The renal pelvis is going to be receiving all of its contents from major and minor, minor combining to form the major calyces. All right, so we have the major calyx, major calyx, and there's calyces is plural. And then you have the minor calyces. The minor are fed by the pyramids. of the kidney. The pyramids are really just a lot of um, little tubes where you have the urine after it's been um, created and then you have the tubes that lead it down to where it'll all come together in the minor calyx and then those will join together to a major, major calyx and then those will all join together to the renal pelvis and the ureter. So it's just all of these are basically tubes of different shapes. This is what we've talked about so far. Pyramids look like pyramids just because there's a bunch of tubes going in the same direction. And so we can see uniform um, anatomy and that makes it stand out. All right, that's enough pyramids. So over the pyramids and kind of like this, we have the outer shell of the kidney, and we call that the cortex. All of the things that we've talked about previous that are in the kidney, inside, not the pelvis so much, but everything that's inside, that would be the medulla. I like to remember medulla and middle. All right, now we have nephrons and glomeruli. Glomeruli, I'm gonna draw in red. They're predominantly in the cortex. And we're gonna zoom in on them, but they are what, uh, we have blood vessels going to the glomeruli and the glomeruli filter stuff out of the blood and then send it through tubules to 
filter things or, or rather recapture things that we want to recapture and then force out a few more things that didn't get filtered. And then, and those are actually going to be kind of in the pyramids. So I'm going to extend this pyramid kind of like that. And then we have the nephrons, which are going to be the transport. They will uh, recapture water as well as just transport things down. So that's the general anatomy. Anyone want me to hit anything else on there before we move forward, just so we, now we know where we are, where we are? Okay, so if you were asked, where are the glomeruli? Cortex. Awesome. All right. And then the nephron is both. Nephron is, yeah, nephron's both. Um, mostly, if you're saying nephron, that's the last part of the tubules, so that's mostly medulla. If you're saying the the tubules before the nephron, that's kind of both. But it can also be totally in the medulla, right? Totally in the medulla for the uh, for a nephron. Nephron, yeah. Okay. Well, what's the green that you talk about? The green is tubules and then nephron. So the stuff way up at the top, those are the tubules. On the outside of the blue line, sort of on the border of the blue line, they're like right next to it. Some of the tubules, the loop of Henle goes down into the medulla. The rest of it is more in the cortex. And then the nephron goes down just like the loop of Henle and goes down into the medulla. And um, yeah. So, good deal. Any other questions on anatomy? Amber? Sorry. So the glomeruli is not part of the nephron. So... I guess I'm not understanding the, where they... The nephron, let's see. Ureter. I'm feeling like the nephron is now supposed to be the bundle of the entire thing. The collecting duct might be... Well, shoot. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay, thank the you. The nephron, because this was even a question on the quiz that really pissed me off. <laughs> the nephron, and I searched everywhere to answer this. I thought that the nephron included the collecting duct, like the whole thing was the nephron. Okay. But the nephron is everything but the collecting tubule that leads to the renal papilla. Okay. Which is annoying. Gotcha. All right, excellent. So nephron is the unit. Okay, so with the um, glomerulus, let's go ahead and zoom in on that guy. He's got an afferent and efferent blood vessels, so stuff coming in with the afferent, stuff coming out with the efferent, and this is going to be just systemic blood, blood of the whole body coming, and then it kind of does... This is a lot more knotty than how I'm drawing it, but that makes it a mess and really hard to draw representations, but it's like this big Gordian knot of blood vessels. Um, Gordian knot is a Greek mythology thing where he tied a huge knot that no one could untie. And so someone finally cut it with a sword and they're like, you're a genius, that's how you untie the thing, it's great. So um, around the glomerulus, um, you have Bowman's capsule which is going to be represented here in black. So Bowman's capsule, I don't know if you're like it was for me, but Bowman's capsule was always like, what the heck is this thing? Like, what's the glomerulus? What's the Bowman's capsule? Why do we have it? Bowman's capsule is just a couple things. Protective sheath around it. Second, it's going to have some things protruding off of it that help support and um, help with the filtration of the glomerulus, the podocytes we'll talk about. Third thing, um, Bowman's capsule is going to be keeping all the fluid that comes out of the glomerulus from going wherever. It's going to channel the fluid. So it's just a sack with a fancy name. So then glomerulus is going to be blood vessels that are all knotted up and they have a lot of holes. They are going to be as leaky as some people's wallets. So there's going to be three layers of the uh, blood vessels. There's going to be the endothelial 
layer, which is just the layer that all blood vessels are made of. They're, all blood vessels are made of endothelial tissue. And that's going to be the red that we have right here. That's endothelial. Then we have the basement membrane, which I'm going to go ahead and represent in blue. And that's kind of a coat around the outside of it. And that also, if I recall correctly, is with um, all blood vessels. It's kind of a support thing. So that the endothelial cells have something to anchor themselves to. Basement. Membrane. Then off of Bowman's capsule, we have these foot-like processes, meaning podocytes. Podo, like podiatrist, foot doctor. So podiatrist, podocytes, podo meaning foot. So we have feet in our kidneys. All right. So these podocytes are going to be close enough together that they make so that the holes that the blood vessels have, which are bigger, are then narrowed up so that not as many things can get out. And the podocytes have a little filtration network made of little protein strands that are part of the podocytes, and they just come together in this little mesh kind of thing, and they catch big things and don't let them out, such as red blood cells and albumin, Two things that you should know do not normally go in the urine. And um, we call these this mesh work a slit diaphragm. Yeah. All right. Now, with the slit diaphragm, which does not let out big proteins, does not let out red blood cells, I'm going to write those up because that's the thing that's like red blood cells and albumin, really. Albumin is like the big example. Keeps, keeps those. Okay, now let's talk about the pressures that make the filtration happen versus the pressures that try and prevent it from happening. So I'm going to draw over here. Here's a blood vessel, glomerulus. And then here's our Bowman's capsule. And then we have blood that is trying to leave with podocytes that are making it a little bit difficult. So the blood going out. Anyone want to take a stab at what the main pressure making the blood want to leave the hose-like structure, the, uh, the blood vessel here. Hydrostatic. Hydrostatic, great. Hydrostatic pressure is going to have a big outward force. Now, hydrostatic pressure just means there is a certain volume of blood in a certain volume of space that causes an amount of pressure. There is going to be higher pressure in the blood vessels than there is in the Bowman's capsule. That makes it move this way. But it does not mean that Bowman's capsule has a pressure of zero. Bowman's capsule actually has, actually has some primary urine, what we call the urine before it's been filtrated is primary urine. Uh, excuse me, not filtrated, processed. So there's primary urine out here. It's not completely empty. And so there is a fluid out here. It's just less. And so the pushback from that fluid is present, it's, but it's small. So we have hydrostatic pressure, a lot going out, just a little pushing back. Make sense? So the net movement would be out. So if we gave these numbers five out, one in, a net movement of roughly four. Cool? Or the one in? It's hydrostatic pressure of the Bowman's capsule. So there's hydrostatic pressure in the blood vessel. You just say what location for hydrostatic pressure. All right. It's higher in the blood, blood vessel, vessel. Than in the Bowman's capsule. Yes, much higher. So that's why it's pushing out. Exactly. Just like if you had a water balloon and you filled up a water balloon and then you had a bucket of water, the water balloon you forced a bunch of water into and you poke it with a little needle, you put it into the bucket of water, it's still going to be spraying out of the water balloon. It's not going to stop going out 
but it probably would go out slower because then it has to push water out of the way for it to get out of the water balloon. That's what's happening here. It's being forced out and it's made a little slower because there is stuff in the way of what's trying to escape. Now, the second one is the one that I think people tend to be like, that word shouldn't exist. I don't like it. It's not my friend. That word is oncotic pressure, which is two words. Oncotic pressure is easiest to understand when you think about water is a slightly um, charged molecule. If you have H2O like so, H2O, the O is slightly negative and the hydrogens are slightly positive. And so there's a separation of charge, which means that it's slightly magnetic. Cool? So, albumin, does anyone remember? This is kind of a detailed question, so like extra kudo bonus points if you remember. Albumin, what is the charge on albumin, positive, negative, or neutral? Negative, I think I heard in that sea of words. So negative is correct. <laughs> All right, so albumin has a negative charge. So we're going to make albumin green right here. Water is charged, so the hydrogens on the water are going to be attracted to the negative charges on the albumin. And so that makes albumin, which is too big to leave, so it has to stay here. Makes albumin basically, have you ever heard where salt goes, water follows? Yeah. This can't move and it's magnetic, so now it becomes where albumin goes, water follows. And so you have a bunch of water that's kind of sticking, loosely speaking, magnetically attracted to the albumin, and that makes so you have oncotic pressure trying to stay in the same place as your little water magnets, is what I call albumin. It's a little water magnet. That's it. So wherever you have water magnets, water is going to try and go there. Hydrostatic pressure is still going to be way stronger. And so even though you have oncotic pressure pushing back, it's only a little bit. And you have hydrostatic pressure pushing back, it's only a little bit. You have a frick ton of hydrostatic pressure trying to make it go out. So oncotic pressure plus Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure is gonna be your resistance, if you will. And then your one thing that's trying to move it out is going to be hydrostatic pressure of the blood vessel, which is a really big number, which is why those other two can't fight it. But they will slow it down a little. What's the third one? You said hydrostatic pressure, oncotic pressure, and some other. So there's two hydrostatic pressures, one that's in the blood vessel, one that's in Bowman's capsule. Okay. And then you have one oncotic pressure because protein shouldn't be going out into the primary urine. And if that happens, that means you have kidney damage. That's bad. So uh, actually, that's um, if you had uh, if you got tackled in a football game, or maybe you had long-term high blood pressure, or long-term high blood sugar, or both of those at once, um, diabetes uncontrolled, you can make so that these get damaged enough that you start having protein go out in the urine, and then all of a sudden you start urinating more. Partially because, partially because these are damaged, but also because the proteins are no longer helping you retain the water that they were holding back before. Because now the proteins are going that way, and where protein goes, water follows. Thumbs. Did you say the albumin has a positive charge and it's attracted to the oxygen? It is a negative charge, and it's the hydrogens are going to be att attracted oh, to it. But the same idea. They're attracted to each other. And, um, yeah. So, does hydrostatic and oncotic pressure make sense? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question and um, answer in your heads, not out loud, so everyone has a chance. All right, so, oh dang. <laughs> I, uh, all right, I'll come up with a new question. I realized I just, I was so excited about my question, I gave it as the example with the football player. So, um, best laid plans of mice. And men. So, let's see. Okay. Someone 
All right, so there is someone who is new to being a vegetarian and they have not been getting a complete protein in their diet. And so their liver has not been able to make very much albumin. They come in with some symptoms. What would you expect their um, glomerular um, filtration? How would you affect that? expect that to be altered? Is it going to be going more this way or more that way and why? Okay, so vegetarian, not getting enough protein. They aren't able to make proteins from the liver. And we'll give it about another 10 seconds or so. Okay, so liver makes most of the proteins, including albumin. If you don't have albumin, then you don't have your little water magnets. And so you don't have oncotic pressure. And so you would have less force trying to keep the water in. So the hydrostatic pressure would be moving more out. You would expect them, among other issues, to probably be urinating more frequently than they otherwise would be, among other issues that uh, like, if it was really bad ascites, but that would be like, usually, uh, I don't know if I've seen a picture of a vegetarian who had ascites because of that, but. Uh, edema could be something, yeah, if it was really bad. So, so low blood protein causes high pressure to be Low blood protein would make so your oncotic pressure was gone because oncotic pressure is because of your water magnets, your little proteins that are trying to hold water there. If you can't make them, they're gone. Right, because you can't magnetically pull them back anymore, can't magnetically hold the water in as much. So then you'd have more blood escaping. All right, cool deal. With that, let's go ahead and... Taylor, so the filtration rate would be increased? Yes, okay. filtration rate would be increased because you don't have the water magnets slowing it down like they're supposed to. All what right. Does that mean for the body? What does that mean for the body? It means that you'd be losing a lot more fluid or some more fluid, and that can make so you have low blood pressure, and um, you know. You said the filtration rate would go up. Mm -hmm. So my question with that is, wouldn't it be like moving too fast so you're not filtering it properly, like quickly enough? So would that necessarily make it go down? So that is a good question with so the amount of fluid that is making it through goes up. The filters that are in place are still going to catch as much as they can. You can have more things go through. Filtration rate, as I recall, you guys have heard it more recently. What I remember filtration rate meaning is how much fluid gets through. As, um, if it means instead how much stuff is prevented from getting through, like how many particulates, then that would change what's going on. Right, so do you guys remember the definition better? Like you guys have heard it more recently. Anyone feel confident on that? Is filtration the same as filtration rate? No, those are different. Filtration fraction is going to be how much of something makes it through. <laughs> See. All right, filtration, fraction. All right, if we had 100 units of creatine, let's just say, or creatinine. If we had 100 units in the blood, so here's our blood vessel, then we had a glomerulus, and then we had blood again, and we had 10 creatinine left, that would be a 90% filtration rate. Okay, so filtration ratio. ratio, perhaps. There is. Sorry. No, it's good. I'm glad you bring it up. Please do. Glomerular filtration rate. Okay. Rate of fluid going through. It's going so fast you can't like catch it. That makes sense. Okay. But I don't know if that's true, so that's why I'm asking. 
And that's a very good thing to ask. And. <laughs> yeah, take a note on that. That's something that I should know, but it's something that everyone will know by Monday. So, okay. We know the direction of the fluid, at least. So oncotic pressure is good? Okay. All right. So with that, before you erase, um, can I just, the slit diaphragm is in the endothelial or the podocytes? Or? It's in between the podocytes. So the podocytes have little proteins coming off of them. And so they sit, the photocytes sit next to each other, and then the little proteins make a mesh. And that mesh is the diaphragm or slit diaphragm. And where does the endothelial come from? Endothelial is just the blood vessel lining that all blood vessels have. Okay. And it's just a layer that we take note of because it's present. Got it. And it happens to have, in the glomerulus, happens, is designed to have um, much more uh, holes. It's much more porous than most blood vessels because we want stuff to be able to leave in a regulated manner. And then the blue thing, basement membrane, that's just for um, structure. So uh, integrity, structural integrity. All right, let's see. Next, calcium levels. Calcium levels in the blood are tightly regulated. This is one of the ions that can be recaptured in the proximal tubules. And so let's talk about how we have some hormones controlling it. And... All right, question for you guys. Where is most of the calcium in the body stored when it is not in the blood? Bones. Bones. All right, and what is the vitamin that is on every single milk commercial? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. All right, so vitamin D is going to help with bones. There you go. Now we have two other vitamins that come from the thyroid area. Vitamins. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Words. Hormones. Hormones. I'm impressed that I can walk and talk today. So, all right. Here's our thyroid. It's a drunk butterfly. These are our parathyroid glands. So, when we are talking about different topic, when we were talking about thyroid hormone, which we're not going into today. We talk about follicular cells of the thyroid. Follicular. Now we're talking about different thyroid cells that are near the follicular cells. And so we're going to call them para, meaning near or around, follicular cells. All right. Both of these are types of thyrocytes, meaning thyroid cells. Okay. Follicular did the whole previous T3, T4 thing. Parafollicular cells, they are what we're concerned about right now. They are going to have one of our hormones regulating calcium, and that is going to be calcitonin. All right. We're going to have another one in a moment. Let's go ahead and do calcitonin. So calcitonin, and I just think vitamin D, because calcitonin and vitamin D are similar in their actions in regards to the bone. However, all right, what you want to remember is what these hormones are reacting to is blood levels of calcium. They don't directly care about the bones. They're trying to make the blood levels of calcium be in the right range. If calcium blood levels get out of the right range, you have a host of issues because that's an ion that needs to be present for normal heart function, normal everything function. Ions getting out of whack is not, not good. So. And they're the parafollicular cells that are sensing that? Parafollicular cells, I believe that they sense the calcium levels, yes, but I can't confirm that for sure. It would make sense, because they're the ones making the hormone, so the negative feedback should be really close, since this is tightly regulated. What's the same thing? Thyrocytes, yeah. All right, so if we have too much calcium in the blood, then we want to do one of three things. Get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. All right, so we have 
formation of bone. And that's the one that vitamin D will help with in particular. And calcitonin will tone down the levels of calcium in the blood is how I remember that. Calcitonin tones it down and stuffs it wherever it can. Calcitonin. All right. The other places, however, and the reason it's in this kidney lecture is because calcitonin will also talk to the kidney saying, kidney, please stop saving so much calcium. We've got enough. Go ahead and let it go. And then you have the gut. That's the stomach. All right. And the arrows are going in for the D and the calcitonin because they're helping you keep it. Yes. So they're moving the calcium out of the blood. Let's put the blood in the middle here. Blood. They're moving it from the blood to the bone, from the blood, and keeping the stomach from absorbing it. Like, don't even absorb it in the first place, or pee it out. In other words, out, out, out. All three of these are places where you can stuff calcium, and it won't be in the blood. So that's what it does. Is that vitamin D there? Vitamin D? That is vitamin D. Vitamin D is specifically for the bone. Okay, so when we have high calcium, the vitamin D is going to take it into the bone and the calcitonin is going to dump it out of the kidneys. Calcitonin will do all three. Vitamin D is here. I'm going to move calcitonin down really quick. Calcitonin does all three. It, it puts it in the bones. It puts it out of the kidneys and it keeps it from coming in the stomach. In other words, out, out, out. Calcitonin does all three. It doesn't care particularly how it keeps calcium blood levels down. It just takes all avenues and makes them all run. Vitamin D is specifically for bone. And you'll get more on vitamin D in the future, like in four to six different classes. So then we have these little guys. They are near the thyroid, so they are called parathyroid glands. And they make, they have cells, let's start there. They have cells that are called chief cells. And they're the only cells you're going to get a name for in the parathyroid, because they're the chief. They're the most important. Um, this is a side question. Does calcium, My favorite. Do muscle contractions in skeletal or small muscle? Um, everything. Okay. Calcium is involved in all muscle contraction. Okay. In cardiac, you have it involved in one extra place than you usually do, which is the plateau phase. Um, but you have calcium involved in all muscle contraction. All right, good question. And chief cells will make parathyroid hormone, or PTH. PTH does the exact opposite thing as calcitonin. It says we need to raise the calcium levels in the blood, so it breaks down bone, it says kidney, save everything, and it says stomach, absorb all you can. So if you can just remember calcitonin, says lower it, then all the rest of it should be intuitive. Isn't really small, right above the chief cells, you just have the PTH. Yeah, parathyroid glands have chief cells which make PTH. Okay, um, last thing that I will mention with the parathyroid hormone, they are chewing up bone. They're making osteoclasts have increased function. So bone macrophages, yeah, osteoclasts. They chew that up. Bone is made of calcium and phosphate. So the phosphate, did, did uh, Professor Schmidt go into the phosphate? Yes? Okay, then let's hit it. All right. So once this makes sense, it's nice and clean, calcitonin out, parathyroid in to the blood. Then if you just think of phosphate as a waste product of trying to get calcium into the blood, we just want to get rid of that. So phosphate will be released by parathyroid hormone because calcium phosphate is what the bone's made of. 
And then it's like, oh, dang, we have phosphate in the blood too much. We need to get rid of that. So parathyroid hormone is going to create the phosphate, but it will handle its own problem by telling the kidney to excrete more phosphate as well as don't absorb more phosphate for the stomach. Phosphate does it for itself? Parathyroid hormone. Oh, like told the kidneys. Um, parathyroid hormone told the kidneys both save calcium and get rid of phosphate. Okay. So parathyroid hormone causes and then fixes the problem of phosphate. Okay. It's taking it out of the bone, the parathyroid? Yes, parathyroid chews up the bone to get the calcium. Byproduct of that is phosphate. And then parathyroid talks to the kidney and stomach and says, get rid of this phosphate. Don't accept any more stomach. Sorry. No worries. Parathyroid have an indirect effect on the bone and Calcitonin have a direct effect since the receptors are on all sides? Um, I don't recall that offhand. Um, could be. Let me know if you find anything on that. Um, yeah. Do you have one more arrow coming from the somatic? The parathyroid takes it from the blood as well? Um, the green arrow. The parathyroid. Uh, oh, sorry, this red arrow was there before for the calcitonin. No, the green one. The green one right here. Parathyroid will take calcium from the bone. It'll accept it from the stomach, and it will tell the kidney, don't pee it up. So they both talk to all three organs and say, either get rid of it or bring it. Okay, now let's go to the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So we got glomerulus. We're moving to a new topic. We have proximal tubule, loop of Henle, distal tubule, and right up here on the distal tubule, you have the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I'm going to go ahead and make some room here. Juxtaglomerular <laughs> apparatus is very near the uh, blood vessels connected to the glomerulus, and you have granule cells, these little green things, granule cells. This is the juxta glomerular apparatus. The juxta glomerular apparatus is going to sense the levels of concentration when the filtration and um, the exchanging of ions that the uh, tubules do is nearly done. And it's going to sense, ah, how much stuff are we needing to get rid of? How much phosphate is in here, maybe? And that is going to tell it how much water is going to be able to be saved. If you have a lot of junk, you're not going to be able to save as much water. So you're going to have to pee out more water, and this will notice. And if you have not very much junk, then you're not going to pee out that much water. And you're going to be able to save a whole bunch. Either way, the juxtaglomerular apparatus's job is to tell the granule cells, hey, this is the concentration I see here. Therefore, this is how much water we can be expecting to, to lose in the next little while. And so you uh, and water affects blood pressure. We lose a lot of water, our blood pressure goes way down. We keep a lot of water, blood pressure goes up. And so the two ways that we can really affect the blood pressure, one of them is blood volume. The other one is blood vessel diameter. If we open blood vessels more, then blood pressure goes down. If we squeeze them, then blood pressure goes up. Yes? Okay. So granule cells are going to turn on a system that will go and tell the blood vessels how much they need to squeeze to keep our blood pressure properly um, at the proper level so that we don't faint or have, you know, capillary rupture if blood pressure was stupid high. And that is called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway or system. Sorry? There was I, two questions. I didn't hear either of them. Sorry. Well, I was wondering what it do. So this is going to tell 
um, the vasoconstriction. It's going to control vaso vasoconstriction levels. Oh. And it can go higher or lower. Angiotensin, angio, blood vessels, vessels, tensin, how tense it is, I guess. Um, and so that is both of these guys are going to be active blood vessel constrictors. So the more renin the granule cells release, the more you're going to be constricting your blood vessels systemically to bring your blood pressure back up. So that's in response to like the juxtamerial cells? The juxta thing, yeah. Yeah. So like how much they're like are filtering through them or next to them or I guess what's the Yeah, so the juxta cells for simplicity, if they see a lot of crud below them, well that's a lot of phosphate, that's a lot of other waste. And right now there's a lot of water there too, but they're looking at how much waste there is. Usually in the, uh, um, oh, geez. Collecting tubules. Collecting tubules, thank you. Usually in the collecting tubules, we are going to recover as much water as possible. How much we can recover is based on uh, two things. One, how, how hard we're trying, because if we're dehydrated, then we suddenly start trying a lot harder. Um, also, how much waste is there? Because if there's waste there, those wastes have charges and they act like trying to hold water there. And so they're basically water magnets. And so if we have a lot of waste leaving, it's going to drag more water with it. More water leaving means our blood pressure will eventually go down, which means we have to do something about that or else we're not going to be able to function. So the juxta will predict how much water we're going to lose based on how much waste it sees and it'll tell the granule cells. I see a lot of waste, please release renin. I don't see much waste, please redu reduce renin. And that's their job. Make sense? So if okay. something was wrong with your demulcular cell. That thing, yeah. Um, that would be a huge problem as far as the That would make your blood pressure pretty difficult to control, yeah. And so we call the granule cells with the juxtaglomerulus apparatus the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? We would say that they're part of it, like the beginning of it. Um, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or pathway is um, everything from the beginning all the way until you end up making aldosterone. There's a, a few enzymes in here, and angiotensin actually is renin goes to the lungs and then the lungs say, hey, I see renin, I'll make angiotensin. And then that goes through the blood and then angiotensin goes to the adrenals and says, make some aldosterone because we need that. Are these granular cells or are they the macula densa cells? Macula densa, that sounds like it's very close to the, that's definitely in the same area. That's like where the ATP gets released. Huh. That's where they like a smooth muscle contraction. On the upper, and like you need it to like relax and dilate. Okay, excellent. Those two cells make up that one. Macula densa. All right. So macula densa is in the area. If anyone. Here in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. I, if, if I may, I thought that it was the job of the macula densa cells in the. Um, the distal convoluted tubule to sense the level of sodium in the blood and respond by constricting or dilating based off of that. Is that true or not true? Um, it could be that the macula densa are going to be, okay, well. They're part of the apparatus. They're part so of they're it? They're part of the apparatus, but one does vasoconstriction and then the other one is gonna sense the sodium changes. So that's how they work together, being the apparatus. To uh, okay. Together. Sweet. So, can we clear up which one aspect? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like the. Well, he did say that the renin angiotensin system. Wow. We're learning more about next quarter, yeah. so he wants us to more so, like, understand the concept of it, but not. Uh, he's going to test us on it more like that is true but i do think he wants you to know the macula densa yeah, the juxta glomerular apparatus and the granule cells presently yeah. so it is good to clear that up okay.
it says that the uh, macula densa causes release of ATP and that's converted to adenosine and that then does the arterial constriction. constriction. Okay, and what signals the uh, macula densa to turn on? Do you know? Is it there? Um, concentration, concentration being high. Concentration being high in? It, it says there will be more NACL reaching the juxtal marial or apparatus of nephron. Okay, so the juxtal marial or apparatus is going to signal the macula densa as well as the granule cells. Macula densa to control how much is making it to the the glomerulus by controlling the uh, blood vessel diameter and then the granule cells will do the hormone side of things is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Does that fit with what everyone can see on their mental slides or the slides in front of them? So I thought the macula densa cells sensed the sodium levels and then reported to the juxtaglomerulus cells to constrict or dilate in the afferent arterium. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus, I am, that one, I'm pretty sure the juxtaglomerular apparatus is sensing what is in the uh, tubules. So I think this is how it goes. If, like, I, yeah, I think this is how it goes. So juxtaglomerular should be sensing in here macula densa. If macula densa is releasing ATP, it has to be by the blood vessels because that's for the smooth muscle ending. Um, and juxta would signal, that, yeah, this, I'm pretty sure this is how it goes. So, all right. Um, besides that particular point, are there any other questions? Because that's how much I have to offer on that one. I hope it's helpful. I have a question about this, about the okay. aquatic pressure you have to ask. Um, is on aquatic pressure the water outside of the blood vessel or inside or both? Oncotic pressure is the pull of proteins wherever we're talking about the proteins. So the proteins in this case are going to be in the blood. And so the pull of water that the proteins exert, how much they ask for water or magnetically attract it, that pull has a name called oncotic pressure. So it would be the proteins inside the blood vessel. And the water follows that. Right. Okay. Good question. All right. Anything else that we want to hit? So sorry, is no, that no. outside of the blood vessel or inside? That would be more, I mean, it's, it's the force will move stuff from outside to inside. So it's kind of hard to, I would say it's an inward moving force. I wouldn't say that it's just outside or just inside. It's affecting both sides, moving water more in. So I would use directions of arrows rather than a inside versus outside. It's which way is it moving? It's going that way. So it's, it's most likely to pull it into the Unless there's something wrong, yes. Normal. Yep. If you've got severe damage, then that's a problem. <laughs> All right, so good luck with your guys' finals and uh, enjoy your break. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you. <laughs> I am guys. Hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you. <laughs> I am going to go 